we're going to finish up our study today of Secret Church, Who Am I? That those of us in here have watched. And tonight we're going to look at the different sections of the second half, second, third section, I suppose, of what David Platt was talking about as far as how does what we looked at in the first session apply the way we view things today. And he, he had some pretty, I won't say controversial topics. There. Most of the topics are not controversial in that sense. Uh, and I, I found myself probably agreeing with most of what he said. And really he didn't answer any questions for us once he got off racism. But he did, I think, give us some things to think about. I think the way he addressed it was good. The Bible doesn't say anything about artificial insemination. It doesn't say anything about artificial intelligence. Those are things that I don't think any person can really say, here's what the Bible says, so you got to do it my way. So I like the way he did it, which was, here are some things to think about. Make your own choice. Do what you think is right. But here are some things you need to consider before you do them. And I like the way he did that, because he wasn't trying to say, this is the only way to do it. This is the answer. Because the Bible doesn't address it. They didn't have that in first century Judea, or anywhere else for that matter. Uh, you got pregnant, though you were supposed to get pregnant, and these issues of artificial insemination and things like we've talked about and he talked about weren't there. So there isn't any way to figure out what the Bible say about it. So I think the way he did it was right. Here are some things to think about and consider before you choose whichever way you're going to choose. And then it's up to you to decide how you want to apply the scripture. And I like the way he did that. Let's pray and we'll, we'll talk about some of these things. God, thank you for tonight. Thank you for each one that's here. Thank you for the study that we've done over the last couple of Saturday mornings. And I pray as we talk about these this evening that your spirit's here to guide us. I pray you give us the insight we need to know. Lead us the way you want us to go. Thank you for being the God that you are and taking care of us. In Jesus' name. Amen. So I... I don't know how many can see around this television. It's humanity and, and he covered several issues. I thought the the first one he covers, if I remember correctly, is sexuality. And his primary purpose, I think, was keep, keep the marriage bed pure. You know, the idea that we're not supposed to be having sex outside of marriage. Uh, we live in a world where that happens all the time. Nobody seems to care about that at all. Uh, even many Christian families do that. But I think he, he covers well the idea that God expects us to be spiritually pure. We live in a world where that's just not encouraged at all. Uh, I took a class at ETSU semester before last that was entitled something like uh, Sex and the Pornification of America. And the idea was what Paul was saying a little bit earlier, that there is, everything goes in America now. Uh, the, uh, the purpose of the class was to show how it had changed really since about 1945 forward. And it covers, you know, the commercials, uh, the movie stars, the, the entertainment people, now, everything you see today, everything's obviously broad, but many commercials, even if they have nothing to do with sex, have something about sex in them. I remember when I used to ride my motorcycle all the time, but you know, if you look at motorcycle commercials, it's got some skipperly dressed woman on it. The idea being, well, if you ride a motorcycle, you get one of these too. And, you know, and just the whole idea is, Let's use sex as a selling tool, and it's got worse and worse and worse. Some of us are old enough to remember Gone with the Wind. Uh, I don't think we were old enough to watch the original, but, you know, it, it created a star when Brett at the very end says, frankly, I don't give a damn. And I'm like, you can't say that on the movies! Now that's, I mean, that's, nobody even says that in the movies anymore, because they've gone way beyond that word. And, you know, there isn't any modesty. There isn't any sense of decorum. It's just, let's just throw it out there. And, you know, we'll get 
the idea of homosexuality, which he really doesn't address much. He sort of skirted the idea. I think he, he made it clear it's a man and a woman in a marriage. He said that, I think he figured that's enough. I'm not going to get into that hot topic. But if you believe that's what it is, then homosexuality is wrong. But you can't hardly watch any movies on TV anymore, certainly the, the sitcoms that are on between after the news and the late night news. Every one of them has a homosexual couple in it. Mm -hmm. Every one of them has somebody that's homosexual who's moving after somebody else, and they're fit right in, everybody loves it. And well, you, you just about can't see a commercial. That's that, well, that, that, is, that is true. I watched, I think, it was, two women kissing each other, yep. two men kissing each other. It's just like, I think Kate Jewelers had something I saw the other day. It started out real nice. Man and woman kissing on each other and showing them the ring. And got the fourth couple with two guys. And they kissed on each other and they showed each other their ring. And we live in a world where that's accepted and they're pushing it as hard as they can to make everybody accept it. Make it appear commonplace. And, and, no, and, and, and it's okay. okay. It's what it's supposed to be. And it wasn't that many years ago where the uproar was. Sally's got two mommies or something. That was the book they were using in kindergarten or first grade to try to push the idea that there's nothing wrong with being homosexual. Because that's the way the world wants it. That's the world, Paul, that John says is of love. That's the world that's being pushed to us. And he makes a comment when it comes to abortion that if we're going to sit by and say nothing, we're just as guilty as the people who are doing it. I think that applies to the entertainment industry and and this other stuff that's going on around us. When we watch those shows. I say we. I don't watch them. I used to love Chicago PD and Chicago Fire and Chicago Mayor. Those things, they all came on Thursday nights, one right after the other. Well, Chicago Fire got himself a homosexual fireman, and now he's got a boyfriend. And I thought, I'm not watching this anymore. And we need to make those calls and those choices. The trouble is, professing Christians love the entertainment. And so they watch all those shows, and they don't care, and they buy the stuff that's sold on them, so companies keep advertising on them. If Christians, anyone who calls themselves Christians, would stop watching those shows, they wouldn't be on, because they're on to make money. But we all watch them. I say we, well, yeah, it's a broad brush, not everybody does, but enough people do to where Hollywood and the other movie industry people know we can push this stuff on people. We're going to keep buying it. We're going to keep watching it, and we're going to keep doing it. Well, it even goes back to the founder of the show, producer, whoever. They're allowing it to be put on there because they're being persecuted if they don't put it on That's there. right, because Christians get blackballed in yeah. Hollywood. And if you stand up for what's right, you don't get a, a role. Correct. And so rather than not have a job, they do the things that producers want them to do. And that's the same thing with us. We've talked about that enough in here. You know, parents who, whose kids play sports, and when they wanted to start playing on Wednesday night and Sunday morning, and the parents didn't stand up and say, my kid's not playing on Sunday morning or Wednesday night. we got church to go to. Instead, they took their kids to ball games, and they let them play sports on Sunday morning. And all they did was teach their kids church isn't important. Baseball is much more important than assembling with other Christian people. And then they wonder why their kids don't want to go to church. Well, their parents have taught them church. doesn't really matter. I'll stay home for any reason. doesn't make any difference. But I'm worried about my kids not going to church. That, that just doesn't compute to me. Why would you be worried about your kids coming to church when you don't go? But that's the world in which we live. And when it comes to the sexuality, we need to live the best we can to do it the way we're supposed to do it. Um, and I don't know how, I don't think we're going to change it. I think Sodom and Gomorrah is amongst us. And, you know, I, I don't believe America ever was a Christian nation. I believe it was founded on Christian principles. So many of our laws were based on the Bible. People professed to be Christian people. We never were a Christian nation like Israel was the nation of God. We were never that. But we're getting worse and worse and worse and worse in America, and I think God's going to finally say, I've had enough of you, and he's going to sweep us under the rug like he's done all the other nations fall. What you're saying, maybe one of the reasons why the young people don't come to church anymore, they see so much on TV, church is not like sure. TV. that's right. It's just a lot, not like life, I think, they can see. So yeah, 
the only movie I can watch that I can remember what I, I like, I like his name that was here, Blue Book. I like that show. It's a nice cop and lawyer movie. Takes me back to the old days. They say grapes around the dinner table, but they drink like fish. Yeah. <laughs> and every one of you can't watch it's them without their Catholic. <laughs> well, they are Catholic. Catholics do drink a lot. But they drink a lot. <laughs> and you can't do anything in that show, but Let's have a drink. But we eat it in separate. But at least they pray around the dinner table and act like they've got some principles. Well, they're united as a family. They are. They around the table. Sunday dinner is important to them. Yes. And it used to be to Christian yeah. people. But again, it's not because we've allowed so many things just to interrupt <laughs> us and distract us the world. It's gotten in the way, and it's just most families don't do that anymore. And again, it's the parents' fault. They've allowed their kids to not come to dinner. They've allowed their kids to show up to dinner with their telephones. And, you know, we look at how horrible the world's going. It's our fault. We have allowed this to happen. And I said we, because it's really my generation. That's really when it started to crumble. When you look at the 50s, 60s, 70s, we lost control there. Vietnam came along, free love came along, Woodstock happened, all this kind of stuff. And we sort of started to slide and it's just got worse and worse and worse. And I don't see anywhere in the world going back at all. Let me give an example. When I was in college in Bernstein, uh, we had a bunch of Catholics, you know, that come down from New York because it's cheaper to go to school down in Kentucky than it was to go to school in New York. Yeah, that's true. They, uh, on, uh, they were Catholics and on, uh, they wanted the, the, the fish on Friday. On, you know, Friday. Right. Yeah. Kind of thing. And well, we got tired of it, so one of them, we got we did it. We put the cheese on the on the meat, so one of the cheese on the fish. Meat. <laughs> <laughs> it's called a fish. <laughs> and you know, we do that, and of course, the fish idea is just made man made rules. Right. And it's those kind of rules that the world is at and thinks you Christians are like idiots. What do you mean you can't eat meat on food? Why not? Where do you get the idea of fish? I mean, yeah. I don't even know where they came to that came from except some Catholic rule was made that you can't eat meat on Fridays. It's some kind of a sacrifice, I guess. I don't even know what started it. But you can eat all the fish you want. So it's not like you have to go hungry. It's not like you're fasting or anything. Right. Yeah, you just can't eat meat. I never did figure that one out. I never had a Catholic be able to explain it to me why that made any sense. And then, of course, they changed it. So now you can eat all the meat you want all year long. So even that rule fell by the wayside. <laughs> it's just, but again, it's the parents who have allowed these things to happen by just giving in and acquiescing to all this stuff. We go to movies to support movie people, most of whom are immoral, most of whom don't believe in God, many of whom don't even believe in America, uh, but we'll go throw our money away to go to the movies, and you know, Debbie loves movies, and so once in a while I go with her, but I don't like movies because I don't like supporting the people. And paying twenty dollars for popcorn. I mean, I can eat. I can eat all month for twenty dollars on popcorn. I gotta go pay twenty dollars for two popcorns and a coke. Give me a break. It's not gonna do it any more than I have to. I mean, I love my wife, so I go once in a while with her just to make her happy. And she knows that's why I go. And it's okay if I fall asleep during the movie. She enjoys the movie. She doesn't wake you up. She doesn't wake me up. She, she's there to enjoy the movie. But. The last point, I think, that he makes throughout this second Saturday stuff was, we're either going to do it God's way or we're going to mess it up. And we're doing a great job of messing it up. And so human sexuality, God gave us the design for it. And it's always been a challenge. Humanity, and I think David said something like this, we messed that up almost from the get-go. And if you read the first few chapters of Genesis, after you get rid of Cain and Abel and move to the next people, with it. Tamer or whichever one of those guys had two two wives and, and just right off the bat he started multiplying. Yeah, started going there and off we went and it got worse and worse and who you know homosexuality is there, it's right there in Sodom and Gomorrah. So humanity didn't take them long to mess up God's plan for sexual relationships. Well I mean he even mentioned that it can ruin a marriage, it can ruin Absolutely. a friendship, it can ruin a life. Sure. He used David as an example. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, these other things can affect your life, but that can really tear some things up yeah. big time. Yeah. Well, that can make babies that you don't want. That's one of the causes for abortion and all this other stuff. So, 
Yeah, if we would just be pure sexually, our world would be a whole lot better place. But that's the beginning of it, and it just goes from there, and it gets worse and worse and worse. He mentions uh, the passage, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, where he quotes Paul saying, every other sin you commit is done outside the body, but a sexual sin is done with the body. It's a sin against the body. I, what does that mean to you? Why does he make that distinction? Because you're sinning with the Holy Spirit, if you're a Christian. Okay, but if I steal something, then why am I not sinning with the Holy Spirit when I go and steal something? How does that distinction? Because the Holy Spirit's with you. The Holy Spirit's with you. you. Anywhere you go, if you're a Christian. If I get drunk, you know, I'm making the Holy Spirit get intoxicated. Same idea. It's my body that's getting that. Why does the sexual sin seem to be such a damning word, if I can use that word, that Paul makes the distinction. That's why when people say to me sometimes, well, sin is sin. I say, it really isn't, not according to Paul. There's a worse sin than others, and sexual sin is it. However you do it, whether it's sex outside of marriage, whether it's homosexual sex, watching pornography, however you want to describe it, Paul says that sin is worse than all the others because it involves your body. And he does want to talk about the, the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. But, again, I can get drunk. I can get my body drunk. How does that not impact the Holy Spirit? I can go steal something and use my hands to rip something off. What do you think is different sexually? Paul, you got to answer? Well, you know, you're supposed to say you think about, think about the sin in the Old Bible, or in the Old Testament, the uh, kings, how many wives they had, sure. how many you know, you know, you know, Well, they did it wrong, yeah. and, and certainly the yeah. Bible tells us they did that. It wasn't right to do it. But yeah, even the leaders of God, and I think that's why many of God's condemnations in once you get to the kingdom is against the kings, against the rulers, because they messed it up. They were leading the people astray. Yeah, I think that's certainly true. I mean, Solomon had 700 and 300 or yeah. whatever. Or whatever. I never yeah. remember three and seven, but yeah. one was one and one was the other. Correct, yeah. But how does that answer Paul's concern of Sexual sins are worse than others. Well, a little, a little before he says every other sin a person commits, he says that he who is joined to the world becomes one spirit with him. Yeah. So we're one spirit. So that, you know, well, just like with every other sin, we're dragging him along to our sins. And if if you remember what he says. In Genesis, as he talks about marriage, you become one flesh with whoever you marry and have the sexual relationship with. Well, I'm dragging the Holy Spirit in the midst of my sexual sin of becoming one flesh with some other woman besides my wife. The Holy Spirit, in essence, is becoming one flesh with that person as well. I don't become one flesh with somebody that I steal from or murder or any of that stuff. But when I'm having a sexual relationship with someone, the Bible term is you're joined with that person. I think like Rob was saying. And so you're taking the Holy Spirit with you to be joined to someone in the midst of the sin you're committing. And I think that's what Paul is saying. Your body's the temple of God, and you're using it in a way that just defames the way God created a man or woman. You're slapping God in the face. In essence, yes. And you're doing it with God's Holy Spirit. Yeah. And I think most of us don't think much about that. The world certainly doesn't think much about that. Uh, again, we've probably all known professing Christian people who are having sex with people they shouldn't be having sex with. You know, it's, it's not unheard of even in our churches that people do that. We don't teach enough about it, probably. We don't stand up against it enough. And again, that's what Platt's point is. The church has allowed these things to happen. And we've sat by quietly. And that saves me. Well, I don't think we... We probably don't teach it at the right point in somebody's life. You know, probably teenagers at appropriate age probably need to hear that before... Yeah. I, mean, I, mean, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, you know, 16, 15, 16-year-olds... On through young adults, not saying an older adult doesn't hear it, but 
if we can embed it into their mind that it's wrong, that might deter future opportunities for, for that to happen. You'd like to hope so, yeah. The trouble is then you've got to have adults obeying it as well. And I agree. I would suspect many of us in this room, maybe all of us, have known older people whose spouses had died when they moved in and started living together. I can't get married, I lose my Social Security. I can't get married, I lose my retirement. I can't get married, I lose my military benefits from my dead spouse. Well, what are we telling the church? Because I've had Christian people tell me that, people who went to church with me. Yeah, we're living together. We can't afford to get married because he would lose his alimony or his retirement check or whatever. And so we can take, teach the kids all we want to that it's wrong. But if they watch us adults doing it anyway, that's going to go in one ear and out there. Hypocrite comes to mind. You know, if we're teaching the, the teenagers, this is the way to do it. But we got people in church doing it wrong, and nobody from the pulpit or the eldership or anybody else saying, you can't do that and, and be acceptable to God. Well, yeah, the teenager is going to say, well, what do we care? That's the same thing. I'm teaching this. <clears throat> well, baseball is more important than church. Hey, same thing. Why don't you, why don't you, go, to, why don't you go to church with us? Yeah, same, same idea. Why should I? Matter of you. So yeah, you it's not, not affecting your life. <laughs> and I stay home and sleep. I don't have to get up in, early on Sunday morning and go play a game that means nothing to my life. And I think that's really the, the struggle we have is the church has drawn the barrier and stayed behind it. The adults have simply played the game. And I don't know, like I said, I don't think there's an easy answer except to turn back to God. It's a simple answer, just not easy. It's a hard, hard task. It's a very hard task. I think that's why Paul makes it so clear. This is a struggle with us. And I think I'm going to even Paul, you know, chapter 7 of Romans, uh, you know, the things I don't want to do, I do, and the things I want to do, I don't do. I mean, he's struggling too. But somewhere we got to still teach the truth. Well, he knows who saves him yes. as well at the end of chapter 7. You know, in verse he does. Months, and and chapter I think eight. he's trying to live right. Correct. You know, and the struggle there is a lot of good Christian folk aren't trying to live right. And then we get a bunch of churches who say, Okay, to be homosexual. God made you that way, and no big deal. We'll, we'll ordain homosexuals as priests and priestesses, and they can do whatever they want to do. We see nothing wrong with it. And I mean, again, we've talked enough about that's where the Methodist church is right now. They're about to split down the middle when the hierarchy decides which way they're going to go. And if they go to say, we're not going to ordain homosexuals. And half the Methodist people are going to leave because they want to ordain homosexuals. Some of them have homosexuals as their preachers already. And, you know, it's a problem in the church. When churches can't follow God's word and do it the way he says do it, why would the world look at us and think, well, I want what you want? We're just a bunch of fighting and hypocrites. Yeah. <laughs> well, it goes back to your article you sent the eldership. You know, 44% of senior ministers believe in a biblical worldview. If you look at the, I don't know if y'all read the rest of the article, when you got down to staff and a youth ministry, Even worse. Yeah. it was down to 4%. Yeah. And they had to be hired by someone in a higher level staff, you yeah. would think. Yeah. But we didn't care what they believed. Good. Correct. And, are you good with kids? That's right. Yeah. Are you good with kids? Can yeah. you, can you are, grow our youth ministry? Can you grow our. Are, are you good kids? Are you not a? Are you good with kids? Can you grow? And are, are you not a pedophile? <laughs> I mean, that's probably the reason. Not, not a pedophile. Not a pedophile. I'm what you don't know. But I mean, you know, the folks asked that. That was true. But four percent was. Ex I just couldn't believe that. I mean, that was ridiculous. But that's that one. The, the next one. Now, which, you, David Platt summed it up for me, and, and uh, you referred to Genesis three. Humans decided to fulfill godly needs in a godly way. Yeah, that's it. That's, what, that's what he's doing. With our free, free will, okay. that right. gave us, yeah. and so that's how we justify it. What God, do you think? God gave me a choice. He made the choice. It's his fault. Yeah. God did it. It's his fault. The second thing he talked about was grace. I would like to hope every Christian on earth would agree. Racism is wrong, if you're going to mean by that. 
treating people who are different from you as less than you, and it's okay to abuse them and take advantage of them and that kind of stuff. As John was talking about earlier, of course, in America, and America's got a lot of bad history in it. I still think it's the best country on the face of the earth, even now. It's losing it, but even now. But when you had Christian people doing the things to their slaves that they did in America, that was wrong. I mean, it, I don't care. We can go back, and I give them some grace by owning slaves, but that's the way the world was. You know, Christians in the Bible owned slaves. That's very clear. They did. But they were taught, treat them well. And it's the, in America, we have the, we think of slaves, we think of black. That's correct. Negro. Yes. As slaves. In biblical times, yeah, the being not they were they were probably the same race. Well, they were, and the some of them were your neighbors, and some of them had been your neighbors. Yeah, they just sold themselves like, for a job and became yeah. slaves. And but there ain't any any justification for racism, treating people poorly simply because they look different from you. And David Platt's absolutely correct. There are no room for that in a church, and, and I'd like to hope. Some more Christians will move beyond that someday. And probably of all the things he talked about, this is our best job. That Christians will learn it doesn't matter what you look like. We're all equal before God. God loves us all. He died for us all. And there's no room to say, I don't want to be around you because you're black. I don't want to be around you because you're Oriental. I don't want to be around you, fill in the blank, whatever it is. A black community say, I don't want to be around you because you're white. You know, and they do, some of them do. And you know, there, there's no room for that, obviously, at all. In California, that church shooting out there, one was uh, Taiwan and Chinese. They were, yeah, yeah, they were all Taiwanese, I thought. No, I one was Taiwan. I don't know if the Taiwan church and that, that Chinese guy went and shot him. I don't know if it, which one it was. I, I, think, I think it was a Taiwanese guy that shot a Taiwanese, Taiwanese bunch of church people for some reason. But, even, but I don't know that that was race. And I think. Our government loves to blow things out of proportion. And you get the guy in Buffalo, I don't know that guy, you know, did he do it because they were black or did he do it because he was just mad that's the first church he found, but it doesn't matter. Our government and news is going to make it. There's another example of white people hating black people, and it's you white people that are causing all the trouble, and it would be nice if some black people would shoot you. I mean, that's basically what they're saying. And you go and listen to our president today, and I'm not going to get political on you, but you know, the things he says, you wonder if he has a brain. But I didn't say that. Yeah, that's okay. Um, but, I mean, he's just doing things no, to, to, to stir up the world. He didn't have to say what he said. He could go in and commiserate with those people and, and cry with them and feel horrible for them, just like we all should, without making it a racist kind of condemnation of white people. Because all that does is cause the non-white people to say, that's right, we need to go kill some white people. And I don't know, it's just the government we've got, and it's both sides of the aisle. They don't care about America. They're worried about themselves and how can I get votes, and I'm going to say what's going to support my voting next time. But racism's wrong. I mean, there isn't any question about it. It's just flat wrong. And I think one of the blessings I had growing up in the military with my dad being in service we were around people of all kinds of races. It did not make a bit of difference to us. And I can, I think, honestly say, not a one of us were over some siblings. Give a hoot what color your skin is or what country you came from. Just be a nice person. And, you know, I know that's not true with everybody. I was blessed, you know, to have been raised in different military bases where you congregated with whoever was there and didn't make any difference. The next one is probably the topic of the, the hour is abortion. You know, with, with the Roe v. Wade potential to get overturned, we're going to have a, an interesting summer when that opinion comes out next month. I think if it stays that way, uh, and people who you know don't care about killing babies are going to they want to kill Supreme Court justices in. I mean, it, it's just crazy the way this world is going. But again, part of that's the media and our national politicians who just want to stir the pot and make things ugly. One thing I want to encourage everybody, the Supreme Court opinion as written does not ban abortion. It doesn't say abortion's bad. 
It doesn't say you shouldn't do it. It doesn't have anything to do with that. So when I watch news people on TV say, this opinion is going to ban abortion, it doesn't ban abortion. What it does is send the decision of whether or not abortions are legal or not back to the states. And if you are ever in a conversation and some idiot says, that opinion is going to ban abortions, you need to be bold enough to step up and say that is not what it says. It sends the decision back to the states where it always should have been. The Roe versus Wade court was wrong. There is no constitutional right to an abortion. And that's, we need to be bold enough to say that if you're in the conversation with somebody who says that. I agree abortion's wrong. I think a child at conception is a human being. And, you know, the numbers he gave us, it's one in three women in America will have an abortion in their lifetime. That, that, that number staggers me, and I hope it's wrong. Although I've got to presume he got that number from somewhere. But can you imagine the, the doctors, the scholars, the religious people who we've killed never had a chance to do anything. Somebody who had the cure for cancer potentially got aborted. Well, the president didn't have to be cancer. That's right. <laughs> Might have had somebody with two legs right now if we hadn't killed all these people in the last 50 years. But it's, I mean, I, I don't, and again, I'm not a woman, so I'm not going to get pregnant and have to worry about a child. But I don't understand how you can kill a baby. It was just staggering. And of course, now they're pushing for and already doing it. If you have an abortion and the child comes out alive, you kill it. Or you oh, push man. it aside and let it die on its own because the intent was to kill it. And that's supported by the Democrat Party. And that's what their platform is. You want an abortion and your baby's born alive anyway, it's okay to just kill it. I mean, I don't know how anybody with any decency could ever vote for a Democrat with a platform like that. I don't care how much you hate Trump and you think he's the worst person on the face of the earth. How do you support a platform that says, kill a baby even if it's born alive? I, I just don't understand. I, I don't think Christians should have a question. That, to me, it sets right there with racism. You know, you don't kill babies. You want to protect the rights of the those who are marginalized and who don't have any rights, that's those babies. They have no way to defend themselves and we'll just kill them by the millions. Uh, that just breaks my heart. What's the easy answer? I don't know. You know, and of course, those who support abortion argue that, well, how many babies have you adopted? How many kids have you taken into your home that were unwanted? They've always got an argument. I don't care if nobody adopts them at all. You don't murder them. You know, we could say, how about the homeless? Let's just go around killing homeless people because they don't have a place to live. You know, I'm not going to take them in my home, so they're a blight on society. Nobody wants them, so why don't we kill them? And, of course, we're headed that direction like Europe does. If you're at a certain age and you're not valuable anymore and you've got some health issues, we're just going to let you die. We're not going to worry about medical care. We're not going to help you survive. We're just going to put you in a hole somewhere and let you die. We're headed that way. Because life has no value. If we're not created in the image of God, I put you down the same way I put down my dog that's sick. Because what difference does it make? You have no soul, you have no value, especially if you have no family. You're just a blight on society. No one's going to miss you. Let's just get put you out of your misery. And we're headed that direction, and some nations are already there. It's a tough world in which we're there, and I apologize to my grandkids almost every day that I'm living in a world that's just horrible. His next one, which is probably when we get to things that are, I won't say controversial, but at least have differences of opinions with people that think, is infertility. And I'll be the first to say, although David Platt was able to say, I can appreciate that because he ended up adopting, they couldn't have babies. Debbie and I took us about five years before we finally got Veronica after we decided, all right, let's start having a baby. Uh, we were getting the word and we started looking at adoption. We contacted some adoption agencies to see that and they were never going to have any kids. And then she got pregnant. And then she went eight more years before she got pregnant again with Valerie. And uh, that's a whole different story. But she called me on New Year's, April Fool's Day. She was in Tucson. I was in Yuma. She called me on April Fool's Day and said, Father, I took a pregnancy test and I'm pregnant. 
But even with adoption, the stuff is so expensive. It is now. I, I would think adoption should be free. Free. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely free. If you've got all these kids that the state's paying for, why are you charging me eight thousand dollars to take this kid? You're going to pay more than that in a year. I'm taking them off your hands. Yeah, I've never figured that out either. Yeah. That's one of those broken parts of the system that we have, is that they charge you an arm and a leg to adopt somebody out that they're trying to get rid of. You think they would gladly give them to you, but they don't. And then you get the private adoptions, and it gets even worse. Yeah. Well, those people are crazy. <coughs> but again, I don't control that either, but that's part of the problem. That is part of the problem. There's money to be made in this, and people take advantage of that, which brings us to the next point. I'm just going to call it eugenics, <coughs> which is basically pre-programming the baby you're going to have, you know, adjusting the DNA and making sure you only get babies that you want. And I want a blonde, <coughs> blue-eyed girl, you know, who's going to be perfectly proportioned so she can marry the football star. And so I'm going to mess with her DNA so I get one that's five foot six, you know, weighs 110 pounds and looks gorgeous. Because that's the DNA I'm bringing in from this girl over here and sticking in my baby. I'm not sure I agree with any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Although talking, I think I think it's good to be talking about it. You know, could we manipulate DNA to cure cancer? Could we find some cure and find whatever it was in our body that caused this cancer to happen and go in and adjust everybody's DNA so no one gets cancer? I'm thinking, I think that'd be okay. I think that'd be pretty cool because if you say no to that, then you've got to say no to going to the doctor to get cured of cancer. I mean, if you're saying, well, if God wanted you to have cancer, you shouldn't play with that. Well, if that's the case, why are you going to chemo? You know, if you think God wants you to have cancer, just die. I think God, some of these things, God gives us the ability and skill to handle it. It's like doctors. Doctors are getting better all the time. How is anything wrong going to the doctor and get well? So if you can do that, why not go to the doctor ahead of time and cure your baby that's in your womb or something like that? And they're doing that. And they have surgery. They take babies out of the womb, do surgeries on them, put them back in. Amazing. You know, that's just amazing. Free birth, I know. Yeah. And so I don't have a problem with some of that. The problem that he mentioned, the problem, is when you start using that to weed out the undesirables. We don't want any more blacks. So we're going to so change. We're all going to have blonde hair. That's right. We're going to be Aryan. Yeah, we're going to be like, super Aryan. Like uh, Hitler. Yeah, we're going to have exactly that. We're all going to look like them. Yeah. Huh? You know where he got the idea. Where? Do you know? The Margaret, Margaret Sanger. Yeah. Right. She was a big proponent of eugenics. Yeah, was she? Back at the turn of the century. Oh, okay. And, and they will say that wasn't because she was racist, but it was. Right. She didn't want the blacks. She didn't want the blacks. Want black. and so let's have the abortion clinics and black homes in black areas, they're much more proportionally aborted than white people babies are. And again, they'll deny that and they try to change history. But that's really why Planned Parenthood came about, was to try to push out the blacks. But, you know, that's history and history is history. They're not doing that today. Yeah, but it's just, you know, we need to be careful. And I think Platt was right. That, these are just some things to think about as modern science continues to advance that we don't abuse, which we will do. This will happen because we're human and we're sinners and somebody will figure out how to do it and they'll do it. And then, you know, then the question is how much is it going to cost? So back to that. Is it going to cost me a million dollars to get the six foot five, you know, pro basketball player to be born out of my womb? Well, I just want a guard. Oh, you want a guard. I, want a guard. I don't need the center guy. He's six, <laughs> six, eleven, seven foot. But that's what he's talking about now. And you know, what is it going to cost? And that only the people who are rich are going to be able to manipulate their babies. And all the rest of us are going to continue to look like we do. And we're just going to get worse. Going to get worse. That's right. We don't want everybody to play sports because all the pros have been pros. And I think he's got a right that we need to be a little concerned about some of that. Well, it's kind of already started to a point with the big scandal of the college, you know, buying people NIL. in. Yeah, to the, I don't remember what college it was or where it was at, but they were paying for them to manipulate their skill set for basketball or tennis or whatever 
so they could get into the good college. That was UCLA and USC. Maybe so. And then they got busted. Yeah. And then like, uh oh. Yeah. So it's similar, kind of already started, but not with the not not with genes, but yeah, they weren't changing their kids. They were just manipulating the school to get their kids in. They were on the rowing team, but they never got on a boat. Yeah, and yeah. they got a scholarship to UCLA. Yeah, that kind of stuff. That, that's always going to be crooks. Yeah, this is obviously much farther than that. Correct. Because we're not all going to get these genes. But that'd be hard. Could you imagine we all did? Then if you're seven foot tall, if everybody else is seven foot tall, then you don't so so matter seven, anymore. Then you'd have to be seven foot five. That's <laughs> right. I'm mean, eight foot. And you know, we'll keep, keep playing God here. And I think that was part of Platt's argument was, how do we manipulate this where it works well for everybody, instead of just the rich and famous? And I think that's, that is part of the chat. And the same is true with artificial intelligence, which is the next one he brought up. Can we manipulate our genes to where I've got a, 165 IQ right out of the womb and I'm reading by the time I'm two or by the time I'm six months and some of that's coming I mean they're already implanting stuff in people's brains and doing all kinds of weird things today and I think it's the same issue of the eugenics of the physical same with the mental are we going to pick and choose who the smart people are going to be or is everybody going to be smart and again that abortion is what gets me with that is that who knows who was the boss because we're aborting somebody. And because not all of them are poor, dirt poor sharecroppers, babies. Some of them are the famous, well to do, successful men and women who have produced these babies that they don't want. So they just flushed them. And who knows what kind of help those people might have been able to come along with. Well, I think some of those that went back to the first topic, the sexuality sin, you had a very high up person go have a relationship with somebody. And they're married. Yeah. She gets pregnant. Uh, that's not happening. Yeah. Sorry. Take care of it. And some of it's that. But, but many people who are married get pregnant and don't want the baby. Yeah. Okay. I've got a career. I'm not going to set my career aside to have this kid. Let's just get rid of it. And I'll keep being CEO or whatever. And I think it's both. Yeah. yeah. But it comes down to selfishness to me. It's I knew what I was doing. I knew the possible mm -hmm. consequence of what I was doing. But I didn't care. I just saw my pleasure. And now that it's a oops, well, it's still all about my pleasure, so I'll get rid of that thing. Uh, it's, it's a tough world we live in with the artificial intelligence. Same problem with the eugenics. Can we manipulate brain power the same as we can physical power? And also, one other thing with the artificial intelligence is creating machines. Yes, yes. That can think better than things like humans. And I remember something from the movie iRobot. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Right. And Will Smith, who's the main character, is telling about how he got his uh, arm, his mm -hmm. superhuman arm. And he said the, a robot that saved him, he crashed into, he went in to save a family that had gone over a bridge into a river. And there was a little girl that was trapped in there and she was trying to get out. And a robot dived in to save him. The robot chose him because he had a higher percentage of survival. Right. And he says a human would know that you save a little girl. Save a little girl. Yeah. yeah. But the robots didn't have that. Yeah. But the same humanity. Long ago movie of 2001 Space Odyssey. Remember the computer on that spaceship out yeah. and took over and fought against the humans because it was intelligent enough to know what was best for the spaceship. And so the computer took over. This was long before we really had computers like today. So it was. Truly science fiction. Uh, but I mean, they're building them that way to where computers do that. And Mike's going to have a robotic surgery, which isn't quite the same, but still, they're using machines and without the doctors having to get in and do some of the stuff that 10 years ago what they had, had to do. And now it's programmed to do it that way. Well, even driving cars now, self driving yeah, cars. Yeah, you don't even have to touch the wheel anymore. I mean, you know, they sense when a car is coming up. Yeah. I mean, her car will start braking. Yeah. But it knows <laughs> that there's a collision happening. Right. Yeah. 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 There's something in the radar. Well, they've got it now where they can parallel park themselves. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> wouldn't that be cool to take a driver's test? I don't know that I'd like to park in. I don't know. Maybe you don't. I don't know. But yeah, certainly the intelligence. Of machines, and of course, 
she raises the question, do, do machines have rights? You know, do they have the right to survive? Or it's like the Terminator movie, you know, mm -hmm. can you go shoot down the star web or whatever that thing was, sky web, uh, and kill the machine that's trying to kill us all? What rights have they got? I don't know. Last thing they touched on was social media. And I agree with them that social media has taken over our lives. Uh, and I, I will never, I say never, I don't think I'll ever forget that I haven't lived here in Tennessee very long. When some guy got arrested for killing someone because she unfriended his daughter yes. on uh, Facebook. Yeah, Facebook murders. murders. Yeah, I mean, how stupid can you be? She un gets unfriended on her makes her feel bad, so you go murder her. I mean, that's taking social media to the way extreme. Mm -hmm. But it is horrible. I mean, and still, I still struggle with, and this is my age, I guess, how can you be cyber bullied? If you don't like what somebody's saying about you, don't Just read don't it. Read it. <laughs> Un follow them. Well, you you, you dive in. That that's your world. Well, that's, no, your, that's that's why I said I'm showing my yeah, age. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, no, that's all they are. They, that's 99 percent of their waking life. And my grandkids do it, and I'm always on them. But their daddy does it. He's a he's a geek tech. I mean, that's what he does. And, and so they've always got their tablet or their phone or their something. And, you know, they come over to the house, we play cards with them. We make them put their phones oh, down. No. Yeah, we may, and they love it. They want to yeah. play. They love coming over to grandma's and playing games. So we make them put their phones and stuff down, and we play games with them. Yeah. We interact. Right. But many parents don't do that. Many grandparents don't do that. Talking with Eric and TR, that's where a lot of the depression yes. and suicide yeah. thoughts come from in exactly right. the young adults. They have that, they have that so-called comparison. You yes. see these other people yeah. with these fantastic lives, although uh, they can't really yeah. see what their lives are like, yeah. but they see they see a computer screen life. Like. And like you said, that's the image you make of yourself is how many people like me, yeah. and who's talking nice to me on Facebook, and that's the image they have of being allowed others to shape their image through a computer screen. Whereas we used to do it because you got beat up in third grade, or you know, <laughs> they, they picked you last with a softball game or something. You know, that made you feel bad. But I don't ever remember wanting to kill somebody because of that. But again, we're living in a violent world where they watch so many games that are just murdering and killing people that you win the game by how many people you can kill. And then we're shocked that if they grow up, they go kill people. What do you expect yeah, them to do? When they turn that thing off and they turn it back on, you start they're alive again. again. That's exactly right. <laughs> people don't really die. But it, yeah, you treat them wrong, I'm going to kill you. And, you know, I love... I like this section he went through with these things because it really does cover what we're talking about. I like the quote he gave us from A.W. Tozer. He says, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What do you think about when you think about God? You know, is he the creator of the universe or is he just this old white bearded guy that's taking all my fun away? Or is he somebody that shows up when I need him, but other than that, I don't care about him. You know, I like that line. You know, the most important thing about us is what do you think about when somebody mentions God? What does he fit into your, your life? And I think that sort of characterizes the whole second half of this book. Is who is God to you? Is he going to get to make the rules? Or is he just somebody that when you're in trouble, you cry out to him? But until then, you do what you want to and don't care about what God does. Well, I like number 28. Uh, topic is to make most of every opportunity. Yeah. So on social media, you have those opportunities that you can interact with people and share the gospel, yeah. share Jesus' love, show that you're a Christian. Yeah. And I've said it once, I said it a thousand times, we can share our worship service. It could go around the world sure. and it would mean no effort really into us but clicking a button. Yeah. And that's battling the evil that's on social media. Which is good. Yes. Yeah. Except the downside, we talked about this. It makes it everybody just stays home. Well, I don't need to go to the building. I can turn on the machine and turn on the Saturday eat breakfast or do whatever I want to, watching people on TV. I don't think we have that many in our congregation that's doing that. But it is a problem in a lot of churches. Their members didn't come back after COVID. Yeah. They just stay home and watch TV when they don't even have to get up on Sunday morning. So they can watch it on YouTube at 2 o'clock. I can sleep till noon or go fishing or whatever I want to do. 
and watch that whenever I want to watch it, which at least if they're watching, that's good. But, but there's a flip side to that as well. It can be abused too. I mean, it takes away the fellowship and you get along. Yeah. How are you connected with God if you're just waiting to bed or at your dinner table watching TV? Are you really worshiping? Are you really engaging? Or is it one of these things, like you say so often, I've checked it off. I went to church today. I watched it on TV. That's my check. And now I can do whatever I want. I, I think it depends on that. It's, are they checking the box off by watching I agree, it? Sure. Or are they truly worshiping? And I agree. But and you I, can I, worship in your cool. car. Yeah. I mean, you know, driving down the road, you can worship. Sure you can. Uh, but is it being abused for a purpose of, I don't want to gather, I don't want to get up yeah. at 10 o'clock? It's selfishness. Yeah. It becomes a Caesar, you just watch it on TV, so I'm not going to go to that. And that's the downside. There's certainly there's a positive side as well. There's a lot of good information on the, on the internet. I love the research I can do on the internet now. You can do it. Well, no, we have no. to ban it. I read really something Abraham Lincoln said that he said on the internet. And I mean, if he said it, it's got to be true. <laughs> yeah. He posted it. Yeah, All right, seven o'clock. Next week we'll get back to James, God willing. I don't have a clue where we're at, but we'll chapter three, talk. verse I'll chapter see. three, one through eight. Well, thank you, John. So yeah, you're you're chapter three. Yeah, it's really that's what he that's <laughs> what he has around for. He takes care of me. Make sure I know what I'm doing most of the time. Sometimes there's a struggle. But yeah, next week we'll do James. I went to the doctor today and they didn't like my heart beating, so I'm wearing a heart monitor. Hey, really? Yeah, so if you'll pray about that in your prayer, I don't think it's anything serious. I don't think. But it's serious enough to work when she heard it. She said, No, we're going to get you a full cardiogram and an EKG, and we're going to put this monitor on you for a week. And we're just going to see you. So in your prayers once in a while, we'll look at you and get my heart still stop you. Other prayers got Mike on Saturday and Friday has the surgery. We get Frank and Wood, so around two o'clock in the afternoon or something, if you start praying for Mike. And Susie. And Susie. 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 And John and Heather as well. This is a tough time for all of them. Keep him in your prayers and the family in your prayers. Anybody else? Amy's uh, daughter, Ivory, she had a nosebleed today. They went and picked her up, took her to the hospital. They kind of got it stopped. She went to the doctor. The doctor said, hey, go have surgery. So she had surgery. She came out of surgery fine. They should be heading home. They should be home by now. She said about 630. So remember Ivory uh, in her part. She didn't know. She's had nosebleeds before. But, yeah, but they, uh, she didn't know exactly what caused it. So the surgery, hopefully, whatever the surgery they had today was apparently very minor because it was in and out type of thing. Yeah. 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 Yeah address them in a Christ-like way so that we can draw people to you and not push them away. God, I do pray for Mike and the surgery he's going to have Friday. I pray for the medical staff, the people that's going to be caring for him. I pray they do the best they can do. And our prayer is that the surgery will help him. And so we pray for that. And God, I do pray for Heather and for John and for Susie and their concern in the situation as well. Pray for Ivory. Thank for the surgery that she had to have. Uh, looks like it may have fixed the problem. I pray that it did. And I just pray that you help her. She recovers from that. And I do pray for my heart situation, whatever that might be. God, that you would just keep that beating the way it's supposed to. Thank you for all that you do for her. I pray for Paul's two cousins. God, that you'd be with them as they struggle with their own issues. Thank you for caring for us all. Thank you for loving us the way you do. We give you all the praise for that. In Jesus' name. Thank you, everybody. It's at, at the end of one of these chapters, it says, if someone were to ask you to explain the primary differences between union and machine, and I was sitting over here about to die to go to the bathroom, and I said, I can't go to the bathroom, they don't. <laughs>